come from John chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that. That was John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. So again, that's verses 13 through 22, where the Bible says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out, out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said, had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which was Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. <clears throat> Those who are members of this congregation will remember last year, we spent several weeks this time of the year Reflecting on Jesus' birth and answering the question, who is this Jesus? Because if there's any time during the year that more people in the world are thinking about Christ, it's this time of the year, many celebrate it as his birthday, though the scriptures do not authorize us to do so, does not tell us exactly when his birthday was and doesn't ask us to do it. But as was mentioned by Jerry Ray during our communion, uh, we have been commissioned to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. We do that every first day of the week. But when people's minds are on Christ, it's certainly a good place to start and talk about who Christ is. So we did that last year. We started a few weeks ago looking this year at the emotions of Jesus. He was born. We started this year where we did last year in Luke chapter 2 at his birth. And it was declared by the angels to the shepherds, this day is born unto thee in the city of David a, a Savior. So he came to be a Savior. But the glad tidings of great joy were declared. And so we capture, first of all, in his announcement of his birth, that he was going to have the emotion of joy. He's going to bring joy. Joy can only come from its source, and so Jesus has been filled with joy. He said to his disciples that he wanted his joy to be in them so that their joy would be full. And then last week we looked at the emotion of sorrow, of grief. In the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, it's described for us that he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He experienced that emotion. Sometimes we just fixate on, on his deity and don't realize that all of our emotions came from the deity that created us. And if we don't know what those emotions really are in reference to how Jesus embodied them, then maybe we don't know how to use them ourselves. And we have those emotions, but if we don't understand them, then we might exercise them in a way that contrary to what the design was. Today we want to talk about the emotion of anger, and Jesus got angry on occasions. Now again, our definition of anger and his experience with anger is two different things. So when you look in the, the Hebrew definition of the word, it, it boils it down to the, the flaring of the nostrils, that the emotion builds up inside and, and our expression, our physical expression, denotes our displeasure, the flaring of the nostrils. 
So you would understand that there's some displeasure involved. Now, just like joy, sometimes our joy is fully dependent upon selfish motives. If somebody doesn't make us happy, then we're not joyous people. And that's not the joy that Jesus was talking about. The joy he was talking about was our salvation, those things that are done for our good. And it pleased him that we could have salvation, reconciliation to God. It sorrowed him, it grieved him when we were separated from those blessings. And so that was conditional and we can, can see how he embodied that emotion. We think about his, his anger. In the Greek context, it means severe displeasure. The Someone would be severely, fiercely displeased. Again, we're not talking about superficial displeasure. That you would displease me and so I'm going to pout about it. I'm going to be angry about it because you didn't provide for me the environment I wanted or uh, the, the relationship that I wanted. And so I'd just be personally angry. And that's not the context at all. In fact, Jesus embodied that emotion so effectively because first of all, he said, my meat, my purpose, my will, while I'm here is to do the will of my Father. So we know his motivation of looking at it in a displeasurable way is it wasn't pleasing to the Father. And that displeased him. That caused him to be disappointed that people would disregard God's blessings that way. So we kind of have to start back and look at what we're talking about with anger. And it means righteous indignation. Indignation then captures that provocative displeasure, that something has provoked displeasure. And we see that in Jesus' experience with, with anger. We looked at one of those last week when we spent some time in Mark chapter 3. You remember he was in the... Uh, the synagogue, and the Jews were watching him to see if he would heal that man who had the withered hand on the Sabbath day. Now, the synagogue was supposed to be in a place to worship, and, and so they knew Jesus was going to come there to worship, and they knew the man had a withered hand, and they knew Jesus had performed miracles, and so they were watching to see if he would perform this miracle, if he would heal that man on the Sabbath day. So they weren't saying, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing during a time of worship, of acknowledging God's greatness and God's goodness, that it would be demonstrated by the Son of God Himself in healing this man's withered hand. Some historian thinks that the man's withered hand was because he was injured during a work experience. And so restoring his hand would have restored his livelihood. Everybody would rejoice in that, and great joy would come, but we remember last week we talked about it grieved the Lord, it caused Him sorrow, that their motivation was entirely contrary to the well-being of this man and the recognition that if anybody could heal the man, they would only get that power to heal from God. They seem to be oblivious to that. But when you go back to that account in Mark, it records for us and reminds us that not only was Jesus grieved, and not only did that make him sad, but we recognize in that context, in verse 5 it said, and when he had looked around about him with anger. He looked around with righteous indignation, with great displeasure, that here is this place that they would assemble to read from the book of God, be as simple as the people of God, hear a message from God, and in this case, would be anticipating a miraculous act from God. And yet their motivations were, if he performs this deed on this Sabbath day, and he breaks the Sabbath, we'll have reason to bring charges against him. And that sorely displeased him. There's that provocative definition of anger. That was the reason behind the provoking of Jesus' anger was their motives for being there on that day were totally oblivious of what the synagogue was for. 
totally oblivious that here is a Messiah that we know and understand that he performed miracles. And the likelihood is if this man with the withered hand is present this, at this synagogue on this day, it's likely that he's going to perform a miracle in healing his hand. And we've got him because it's a Sabbath day. And it said that Jesus was moved with anger, righteous indignation. He knew why he was here. He knew what the miraculous things were supposed to do. Demonstrate that he was the very son of God that he claimed to be. And they totally disregarded the evidence of the miracle. We're just looking for something to accuse him of. And they would do that. As they left the synagogue, they said, they consulted with Herodians that here we've got him. Here's what he's done. That provoked Jesus' displeasure. You see, that becomes important for us to understand in our definition that that's the case. So this was a, a Sabbath day transgression. You remember the Lord asked them in verse 4 of that context, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And they held their peace. Now, if they thought he was going to do something contrary to the Sabbath day, you would think they'd use the context to enlighten him, to make sure he was right with the Father. That wasn't their motives. And so he's asking them, this is a good deed. Is it okay to do a, a good deed to save a life on the Sabbath day or to kill? And they couldn't answer. They didn't answer. And because they were so inwardly focused on what they were intended to do and oblivious to what he was about to do and what that demonstrated, Jesus was moved, looked around about with anger. Now you couple that with the grief. He said not only looked around with anger, being grieved for their hardness. That sorrow and that anger are mixed together because of what they're doing, and they're withholding their view of, of the Lord. What Zach read for us in, in John chapter 2 is probably the most familiar context that most of us would go to and said, what would be evidence where Jesus' anger, righteous indignation, would have been provoked? Since that's the definition of anger, what would have displeased the Lord to the point that, that he would go into the temple and turn over tables? It wasn't because he didn't get his way or somebody didn't invite him and uh, he was slighted in some way. It wasn't a personal thing to the Lord of saying, look, I want to draw attention to myself. In fact, what Zach read for us in, in John chapter 2 is a fulfillment of prophecy. In fact, when the disciples saw him do that, in verse 17, it said they remembered what was written. Whatever took place there, whatever emotion that the Lord displayed there caused them not to say, boy, he lost it, didn't he? I don't know what's wrong with him, but he lost it. That's not how they looked at it. It said that it caused them to remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house eateth me up. You see, when you look at all the accounts together, this happens to be John's account, but when you look at, at Matthew chapter 21 and you look at um, Luke chapter 22 <clears throat> and you look at Mark chapter 12, you put those together, you get the full context. And what it says about the Lord is he sees them taking that temple area and they're selling sacrifices and they had a right to purchase their sacrifices when they came to worship. But they had an outside place, outside the temple, where you could go and purchase your sacrifice. A lot of people traveled. You remember Paul ended his class, our Paul, not the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul ended his class this morning, reminding us from Acts chapter 2, when they came together on Pentecost, they came from all these different nations. Well, when they came together for those holy days as Jews, they traveled a long distance. And so sometimes they either didn't bring their sacrifices with them and purchase them when they got there, so it was, it was okay for them to do that. The scriptures allowed them to purchase their sacrifices. But it didn't allow for those selling the sacrifices to make profit 
offer those sacrifices. They could sell them, but they were gouging the people, and they'd moved inside the temple area. And so when Jesus gets there, it's a fulfillment of Scripture, this righteous indignation. He knows what the temple is for. He knows what they could do and what they're doing wrongly. And so he's provoked. The word zeal there is used. He is zealous for the Lord. That's what provokes him. It doesn't please God for them to have abused those sacrifices and the selling of those sacrifices inside the temple so they could make money. That wasn't what they came to the temple for. That wasn't what worship was for. And so Jesus demonstrates what provoked him. And you remember he made whips. Again, you put all those accounts together. He made whips and drove them out. And he said, you have made the house of God a den of thieves. It's all about you, not about God. All about you making money not worshiping God. And he wasn't going to stand for it. And so tonight we'll talk about how we can be angry and sin not. How we make application of these emotions that, that Jesus demonstrated. He was displeased. It provoked him to demonstrate his displeasure and say, we're going to put things back where they need to be. Not because he didn't get his way, but because they had perverted God's way. And that provoked him. That caused his nostrils to flare to say, the house of God is intended for God to be worshipped. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. And he cleared all them out and he turned over the tables and he told those who had doves, you go and make sure you don't let this happen anymore. You get them out of here. Because that's not what the temple was for. So we get those contexts. So we see that the healing on the Sabbath day provoked him because of their attitude. We know the abuse of selling the sacrifice at the temple provoked him to anger. There was a reason for it, a context for it, and an expression that he could carry out that would be right and acceptable. He even prophesied that would happen. His zeal for God would eat him up. Cause him not to be able to stand by and let those things go on. To bring correction to them. Now that's not always the way we exhibit anger, is it? Now, ah, well, somebody just made us angry and we just go off. Cause all kinds of destruction. Not because we want things to be made right. Because we have to come back and apologize for what we did because it wasn't right. So that's a little different, isn't it? Anger is a real emotion. God gave it to us to be used for proper uses and to make sure we protect each other and protect ourselves. It, it's there for that reason, for us to know right and for us to carry it out in a way that would be healthy and good. Jesus was even angry, provoked by his own disciples. Now they went around trying to protect him. You know, he was the Messiah, but he was kind of their Messiah. He was a savior, but he's kind of their savior. And they hadn't fully learned things yet. And, and so when you look at context <clears throat> like Mark chapter 10 and verse 14, you have different people bringing children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them. People were excited about the Messiah. We want our kids to get close to the Messiah. Brought all their children and the disciples rebuked them. Don't bother the Lord with those children. Sometimes we can do that, can't we? I've raised my kids. Don't get your kids around me. We, we sometimes have attitudes about children. And so they're saying, look, don't bring all them noisy kids around the Lord. And, you know, they rebuke the parents and the people who were bringing the children. And it said of the Lord that that angered him. He was displeased with them. And that's where that beautiful passage that we quote sometimes, just pull it out of there, don't really know the broader context of it. We don't realize that that was a context that Jesus demonstrated his righteous indignation, his strong displeasure for their behavior. He said, you suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. You get this right. You need to recognize that the kingdom of heaven needs to be made up of people like little children. They have these innocent hearts and have these pure lives 
you don't withhold those children for coming to me. He made that which they had abused, neglected, and perverted right. He didn't just say, look, I want that child, and boy, that's a good-looking child. He said, you suffer the little children to come unto me. And he embraced them and took them in and said, look, they demonstrate for all of us what we're striving for to be like they are. Don't remove those from me. Those become important things for all of us to remember. When you go back and look at passages like Exodus chapter 34, and it's describing the Lord and His kindness and His mercy and His goodness. And it said that He is filled with loving kindness and long-suffering. But then it turns its attention to the wrath of God. So the nature of God, the purpose of God, the, the exhibiting of His compassion toward us is, is based upon His love and His compassion. But if we displease Him... If we transgress His will, if we're not obedient to Him, then His nostrils will flare. He will be displeased. Not because we're His puppets and He's needing something from us, but because of what He's done for us that we would forfeit, that we would lose. You'd have to go all the way back to, to look at Deuteronomy chapter 20 and, and verse 19 to, to see the broader context where he has Moses gather people together and said, here's what I'm doing for you. Here's what I'm planning for you. This is what I have in store for you. This land is going to be yours and I'm going to bless you. I've freed you from Egypt. But I'm placing before you this day as a record. It'll be recorded that you've had this opportunity. I'm laying before you this day Good and evil, life and death, choose life and live. So that you and your children shall live. So it's all about what he wanted for us and so it displeases him. It provokes him to anger when we forfeit that. It's not a selfish thing on his part to say, you didn't do what I told you to do. So I'm going to punish you. He doesn't have any choice but to punish us if he's going to be righteous because of our sinful nature. But he wants to bless us. The long-suffering of God. And so we want to take that context and, and bring that to a conclusion in our life. So it's a, a righteous indignation that's based upon God being provoked and God in the sense we're talking about Jesus. Jesus being provoked or displeased because God's will it transgress. And not just that we made God mad, but that God loved us enough to send His Son to die for us, and Jesus came to be that Lamb to take away our sins. And if we forfeit that, that greatly displeases Him. It angers Him. There's righteous indignation that comes with that. But you see, not only was His anger righteous, but it was restrained. Now, even in any of those times, he could have just called down fire from heaven and consumed him. In fact, you remember James and John on one occasion <laughs> asked him to do just that, did he? Why don't you just call down fire from heaven and consume these folks that are rejecting you? He could have, had the power to. He was displeased with their actions, but he restrained that. That passage in, in Exodus chapter 34 said, His long-suffering... What do you mean? He's got to bring about justice. He's going to punish disobedience. But he restrains it. If that continues to be the case, it will be provoked to the point where he can't restrain it. But he restrains it. That's the long-suffering of God. And when you put that in a New Testament context in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it describes the days of Noah. Then it said... He doesn't desire that any perish, but that all come to repentance. But he said, long-suffering of God gives us time for that repentance. He restrains it. Though his nostrils would flare with displeasure when we reject it, he gives us time to repent of that. 
The long-suffering of God gives us that time to repent it, though He's displeased with our actions. And He uses that day of Noah. He preached 120 years. He was long-suffering. There came a time when that time was up. But He was patient. He was displeased, obviously, because you can't read Genesis 6 without seeing God displeased. <laughs> and so Jesus expresses that in His earthly ministry. He restrained that. As he's hanging on the cross, he looks down at these angry, jeering people who wanted him crucified and are glad he's hanging there. Listen to him. You see, my anger is often different than that. When I'm provoked, it becomes personal. And if I have the strength and power to do something about it, I might do it. He had the strength and the power. He could have called and petitioned God and he would have sent 12 legions of angels to rescue him. He looked down with great displeasure on what was taking place, but he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Restrained it. That's the emotion that Jesus had, this anger. That's the example you and I have to look to. And we're trying to say, since we have this, and you say, well, you know, I'm just, I just have that disposition, and, you know, I, I can't do anything about it. Better pay attention. It's an emotion that we receive from God. It, we have a perfect example in Jesus how to exercise it. Okay for our nostrils to flare. Okay for us to be provoked to displeasure. But how do we handle that displeasure? Do we restrain it? So that things can be sorted out. Is that our desire and our hope? Are we just offended at something and people have to make that right or our anger is not going to be appeased? He could have done something about it. But his love for them allowed himself to restrain himself. Finally, we understand the Lord's emotion of anger. The ultimate carrying out of the displeasure is reserved. There'll come a time when he can no longer be patient, just like he was in the days of Noah. Came a time when time was up. There came a time as you've been studying on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights about the people of God being carried into Babylonian captivity. He restrained his anger. He gave them time to change, and when they didn't, he carried them away into captivity. It was to reconcile them to him and but ultimately, there came that time of punishment. Jesus' punishment is that way. and In fact, in Acts chapter 17, Paul describes, as he's preaching to the people of Athens, he lets them know who God is and that God created all things and in Him we live and move and have our being. And then he describes to us, at the time of this ignorance, God winked at. He was patient. At the time of this ignorance, God winked at, restrained his displeasure. But he at the point of the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he ordained. Guess who that is? That's Jesus. Yes, it's been restrained because of his love for us. His long suffering toward us. But there's going to come a day when that righteous indignation, that displeasure of our sin, would no longer be tolerated. But what a long-suffering Savior we have. It's described this way in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ye which are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus... Ah, oh, the one that had that emotion of anger displayed while he was here on this earth. Listen to it. You rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Time will be up. Disobedience brings great displeasure to God, but He's long-suffering. He restrains it, but there comes a time when 
that won't be the case. That indignation will be reserved for that day. And when Jesus was here, expressing that displeasure in those different moments that we see, and we see how He displayed that displeasure, when He was asked about the final day in Matthew chapter 24, He said, Of that day and of that hour knoweth no man but the Father who art in heaven. But that indignation, that righteous indignation, that nostril flaring indignation, that provoked displeasure has a time when time will be up. And that's described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. But I want you to listen to these words as that particular section reveals to us how the Lord feels about that rejection of his gospel. He said, verse 9, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. This power of him being displeased, saying, I want to save you. Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. Give them opportunity. Be long-suffering and patient to them. There's going to come a time when that righteous indignation will be carried out. That emotion of sin being separated from God will be displayed. Verse 10 said, When he shall come to be glorified with his saints and to be admired of all them that believe because of the testimony among you, you believe in that day. Now listen. Wherefore also we pray also for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling, fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith of his power. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus embodied the emotion of anger. But he wasn't an angry person. He didn't go around with a chip on his shoulder all the time, and if anybody crossed him, he blew up out of control. Everything about his anger had a purpose. You see, the key to the emotion of our Lord is that he was displeased, provoked to righteous indignation by the right things at the right time at the right degree, for the right purpose, and in the right way. That's true with all emotions, isn't it? But all do we need to know that about the emotion of anger. Righteous indignation. When Paul stood before Agrippa, the Apostle Paul stood before Agrippa in Acts chapter 24, in those last few verses of that chapter, Paul reasoned with Felix, listen, of righteousness and of temperance and of judgment to come. Righteousness, the right thing. That's why he was displeased, because they weren't doing the right thing and he wanted them to be right with the Lord. Temperance, the restraint, the control of that displeasure. He's reasoned with him, saying, God's given us an opportunity but the reserved indignation and judgment to come. Have to understand those things. Maybe that will help us understand anger a little better and how the Lord exercised it and how pleased we ought to be that we have an opportunity because of His long-suffering to repent if we're not in harmony with His will. If you're not a child of God, He wants you to be so desperately. That's why Jesus came. That's why He died. If you believe that He is the Son of God and you're willing to turn away from your sins of repentance, confess His name before those who are assembled here, be buried with Him in baptism, you can arise to walk in newness of life. He wants that for you. He doesn't desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He will continue to cleanse you of your sins, remove all displeasure from your life if we walk in the light. He is in the light. And when we recognize our sins, if we confess those sins, 
we can then be pleasing to God again. We won't flare his nostrils because that's what he designed for us to do. That's the emotion that he wants to have toward us. He wants us to be right. He's displeased when we're not. Not just displeased with us at the moment, but displeased that we would not choose to have our sins forgiven so we could have the blessings in store. Do you want those this morning? We'd like to help you have those and please the Lord in doing so. While together we stand and while we sing.